online. Uh, hello, also to everybody online. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, some mathematical aspects of uh, general relativity. And um, initially, I have planned to talk a lot about, about a lot of different things, uh, basically everything that I know, but then I kind of decided that's a little bit too much. So um, I'm going to kind of keep it down to the basics. And um, so I'm just going to give you a kind of a short outline of that talk. Um, so I'll call it a primer. Um, mathematical general activity and so basically my aim is that at the end of the talk uh, you understand a few things um, I'm going to say now so the first thing I'm going to talk about are what are space times this is just like a, a geometric setting if you want then um, I don't. Uh, okay, don't skip anything. Okay, then I'm going to um, say what are the Einstein equations. These are nonlinear partial differential equations, uh, which are geometric equations. And um, I'm going to give you some examples, so solutions of those equations that are pretty famous. Simple examples. And um, now I have to, yeah, okay. So, so the, uh, the rest of is, I kind of did it a little bit in a historical order, but some things are kind of parallel. So then I'm going to talk about uh, initial value formulation. Because what you have here are uh, differential equations, and here you're just going to have some explicit uh, solutions of those. But then, as a mathematician, of course, you want to understand all, all of those solutions. And so, you have to try to formulate this more abstractly and come up with a Cauchy problem, which you don't know explicit solutions, but uh, qualitative behavior and uh, local existence and things like that. And um, so, this is more of an analytic. Uh, so, here I'm just not going to explain too much, but just the analytic framework of how one goes on about solving these uh, equations. And then um, I'm going to talk about what I had already written in the abstract. So, from a very um, general perspective, I'm going to talk about the singularity theorems uh, of, of Penrose and Hawking, for which uh, Penrose also received the uh, Nobel Prize last year, I think, last year. Yeah. They're also called incompleteness theorems because they're about geodesic incompleteness. So I'm just going to say, well, maybe you've already heard those, um, but I'm just going to say what they are about and what they what they tell us and what they don't tell us. And well, then there are a lot of other topics which I probably cannot talk about, but some some will also appear in my second talk. So uh, we'll see. I'll probably not. Okay, so let's start with uh, space times. Or I can start uh, actually more basic than that is uh, a radical. So assume that uh, M is smooth. And some of these uh, assumptions, of course, can be relaxed, but I'm going to stick with the most uh, simple ones. So smooth, second countable. And usually also what you want is a connected. Manifold um, dimension n plus one. Just uh, that is n plus one because one should be the time and n should be the space. Then we equip this manifold with uh, Lorentzian metric G. So G is a metric on M. You know, Riemannian matrix is basically also a bilinear form. So it's non degenerate. And uh, which means that uh, what you still have is that uh, you take plug in two tension vectors. 
in w is zero for all w, then this implies that the quality has to be zero. And uh, the other one is that it has this particular signature. Uh, n comma one, or how we also often write is minus and then passes. Okay, so in the Romanian case, you of course you don't have the minus, but everything else uh, is the same. Um, and um, yeah, so this we call a um, uh, Lorentzian manifold, and the simplest example is the Minkowski space, or generally Lorentzian vector space. Minkowski space. Please, I'm say exactly what that is later. Um, R of one comma three, so the n should be three in this case, but it could be n. And you equip that with a Lorentz symmetric um, in a way that um, for two vectors, so this eta with a Minkowski. And uh, in Cartesian coordinates, you're, it's just minus V naught, W naught plus three. So again, if I would drop this term, I would have my Euclidean, Euclidean metric, but now I have a uh, the right same one. These are highest conforms. Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry, yeah, that's right. So I denote it by naught so that we can start with one for the space. Okay, so this is just an um, example of the two Lorentz manifold, the most basic one, of the, but also the most important one, just like you can space, so it's a tiny manifold. And um, what do you see here that um, is already that the tension vectors can have different uh, character, and we call this a causal character. So causal character. Vectors. Or more, more specifically also of curves and vector fields and so on. Um, Vectors. Um, and for this, uh, you should have always this uh, image of, uh, of a tangent cone, of the light cone in your mind. So this is like if I draw here a tangent space. And I draw it three dimensional, so two plus one dimensional, of course. You have your point, and then the tangent space uh, consists uh, essentially of three different regions. Let's draw it, and then I'll say something about it. So, this is if you want uh, space, and this is the pan direction. And we have three different uh, vectors, tension vectors. So the first one is, uh, well, noted here by V. So this is called a time like vector. So V is time like if um, G V is less than zero. So if, for example, if you plug in V1000 uh, zero, 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 and so on, then of course you get minus one and then it will be negative. I hope you can read that. Um, then we have um, null vectors, which uh, as the name suggests, um, if you apply G, then it's zero. And then you have um, space like vectors, which is positive. So, okay, so it's called space like. G 
And uh, these two together are usually also called causal. So if you have a causal vector, it could be timeline or no. Um, and I said, yeah. by the way, apparently people online don't see blue. Don't see blue? So okay. blue is uh, forbidden. Okay, okay. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, it's difficult. I can see that. Should I re rewrite it or is it uh, So at least. Uh, I'm not going to use colors too many times. But. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, you know, but it looks now it looks almost like green. <laughs> um, yeah, so this uh, this is called the light cone, and uh, basically our whole life takes place inside that light cone. So if we are well, now you can think of Minkowski space, but uh, we're kind of moving inside that light light cone. And you can also call it a world line or it's a, a curve, basically a time like curve. So we are moving. In our life along timeline curves. And uh, if you're closer to the light cone, to the actual cone, then of course you're moving at the speed of light or almost at the speed of light. And if you just uh, stay in the middle, then you're just not moving at all. Okay, so, so in Lorentz and geometry, everything that takes place inside the light cone is much more important than everything that takes place outside because of that. So, this is a basic. Um, Definition of uh, what the Lorentzian manifold is and uh, what uh, what are important differences in the Riemannian. But of course, uh, I call this a section uh, space time, so I have to also say what space times are. And this is about time orientation. And uh, you already see this here uh, in this picture. You have this double cone, and essentially having a time orientation means that you can globally choose a future or a past. Uh, so essentially, it means that you're able to continuously pick uh, one one cone. But uh, you can also write this in terms of vector fields, of course. That um, so a Lorentzian manifold. Time-oriented or time-orientable. Of course, once it's time orientable, you assume that you have chosen an orientation. If, uh, if there is a continuous uh, time like the non, non vanishing time like vector field, you That means we pick a future. We can pick a future in the past, and we don't kind of get into trouble by doing so. And the first question that you may have, well, okay, now let me, you know, let me think. The first question that you may have is, well, do such structures always exist, or how rare are they? And uh, that's one one difference, major difference, already to Riemannian geometry that every manifold can be equipped with a Riemannian metric, even a complete one. But not and every manifold admits a Lorentzian metric. So that's that's more special. And even fewer, of course, are time orientable. So I'm gonna just uh, um, not use the how, how many people do that or do you use the blackboard no, in the back? No. It's completely useless. That's the ignore. Okay, thank you. <laughs> just not that okay. no. No? you can use it. Effort to, for things that you want to stay longer. Okay, I should have done that before. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> the wrong way around now. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I just, uh, yeah, well, I killed that one piece. I hope you remember um, that example of the concrete space and that M is manifold. Okay, so, so one of the first questions you should have, well, well, that's, uh, well, maybe I should also define 
what a space time is, not a not a strange definition. Um, it's actually not that hard, but um, it's a it's a Lorentzian manifold that's a time orientable. <laughs> Uh, and in addition to that, most people assume a little bit more so and um, connect that it should be that I have already written down, but uh, just to emphasize it again. And many people also assume that it's non compact, and now you will see why that is the case. Non compact. Uh, All the space time. And so the question that we have is well, um, is every manifold. such structures and the answer is no but of course we can say more than that um, but but we have a zero that tells us when when we can do it so the zero is the following which is the zero uh, we can characterize then a manifold that meets a space time structure. Um, so, the first is, of course, uh, it's a Lorentz metric on M. Uh, there is a time orientable one so that uh, we have a space time. Um, the third one is that uh, So there exists, there exists a non vanishing vector field on M. And the fourth one is pretty much the only topological thing I'm, I'm going to say here. Um, so that either M is non compact. Explain why people use non compact. Or M is compact with other characteristic, with vanishing other characteristic. If M is non compact, there is no problem. There is one. There's always, yeah. So, so. I'm going to say, I'm not going to write down a proof or so, but I'm going to say a little bit about that. So the, the equivalence between three and four is, is just topological. So there is no Lorentzian um, metric involved. Um, of course, the two implies one is also trivial. And uh, maybe we should write down something. And then now maybe I'm going to say how you can show that uh, if you have a non vanishing vector field, you get a time oriented uh, Lorentzian manifold. It's maybe the most interesting. And then uh, one implies four. Yeah, I will say that after that. Okay, so if you have, a, so let's just write. A, Sketch or so. So, what did we say? Non rational vector field three. 
Okay, we have we assume we have a null matching vector field X. So uh, As I already said, we know that every manifold can be equipped with a, with a Riemannian metric. And so what we do is uh, for H to be Riemannian on M, we just define um, T to be H minus uh, the dual of this vector norm. Uh, so U should be just uh, the unit. Uh, the dual of the unit uh, vector field that we have given to us. And then one can show that this is, uh, that U is in fact, uh, so this is a Lorentzian metric, and U is in fact a time like, non vanishing and time like for this G. And so we automatically have, by the definition of uh, space time, we already have a time yard orientation as well. Yeah. So basically, you can say that. I'm a little bit confused about the orientability. I have yeah. sort of the feeling that you can put the Lorentzian metric if my tangent bundle splits off a line bundle, but that would be only time oriented if that line bundle is orientable. Well, it's not vanishing. I, uh, I, I, yes, sir. That, yeah. so that, that does three implies two that I agree with. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so what, uh, oh, sorry. What, what did you mean then? Well, so I, if I have a line bundle on M, then I can put some metric there with a minus sign. And then I have something on the mm -hmm. complement that will give me a Lorentzian metric, mm -hmm. but that will not be a time orientable one, right? Well, well this vector field is, gives me a time, this is time like in this metric G. Yeah, the way I have defined it. Not identical, but it does, the theorem says that you can find another one which is time identical. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, then we seem to be saying that if you can split a perhaps non orientable line bundle, you can split a, a trivial one. Right? Can implicitly something like this must be happening? Right. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I think I wrote it correctly, but. Uh, let me just see what I have, I have here. Um, oh, sorry. I, uh. yeah. <laughs> so, you, okay. So, otherwise, you can, yeah. Now, U is unital, and then you subtract two. So, you're minus one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, it will be zero. Yeah, that's not my conclusion, but uh, I yeah. think I just go on. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, that, that gives me a three to, uh, Two and then uh, you can also show that uh, one implies four, and of course uh, you can distinguish already the case that two implies four um, from from what I have said uh, before. So two implies no. Uh, I'm confused with what I already said. Um, Oh, well, of course, this is two implies three is it's trivial because that, that is what time oriented means that we have a non vanishing vector field. Um, one implies um, uh, four is uh, if it's non orientable. Uh, so if, if M is not time orientable. Then one can show that the double cover is time orientable. And then either M is non-compact. And if it's if it's if it's compact, then also the covering is compact. And therefore we have to have the double characteristic is zero. Okay. So then uh, So basically, the idea is that, of course, you have these cones and you have two directions. And uh, if you go to a covering, then you can make a time oriented. And then uh, either it's non compact, um, or if it's compact, you have that. Uh, zero. 
Okay. So this is just to give you an idea that um, um, Lorentz symmetrics and uh, especially time interval ones don't always exist, but if we assume non-compact, uh, then we are fine. And this is what we also usually do. So this already makes it a lot harder, of course, because non compact manifolds are a lot harder to, to handle than the compact ones or complete ones uh, in many cases. But this is kind of built in, in our theory that we have to we have to really look at non compact ones. And there's another problem that uh, compact, um, even if you have um, a uh, time orientable uh, Lorentz symmetric on a compact manifold, there's another problem. Well, we don't want to look at it, and this is a physical reason is that uh, I can well, I can't explain nature of how it works, but uh, how, the, how the proof works. But um, in addition, we get that if M is a compact space time. Then it must contain closed time length curves. And this is, of course, physically the same as, as allowing time travel, and you don't want that. So this is time travel. Okay. And for physical reasons, we don't we don't want to look at those at all. If we want to do general relativity, so you always we are always handling non-compact manifolds, and for those we already know that we have a Lorentz symmetric. But of course, there are people so who are studying compact. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are a lot of people who study compact Lorentz manifolds, so it's it's also a field, right? But it has nothing to do with general relativity, if you want. <clears throat> But of course, it, it has other nice features, but unfortunately, I know very little about it. <laughs> okay. But yeah, if you want to have your own theory of time travel, then uh, you just have to pick a compact manifold and you're, you're done, basically, on the characteristic theory. You don't even have to choose a particular one because you already know that it's going to be containing uh, closed time length curves. Um, and I'll say why that is later, but I first need to introduce a little bit more um, terminology. Okay, so it's already half of my time is already over. And I had just said what, uh, what a space time is. Okay, so. Uh, and I heard, yeah. Let's see, there's a question from yeah. the chat. Uh, maybe we can just unmute and the person can ask if they want. Or should I just. Wanna, read? I don't know if I'm. Yeah. Okay, I just read. Okay, yes, read. okay. so this is says, so Nicolas. Says, does this also work the other way? If there is a closed time like curve, then it is compact. No, 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 no. no. I think you can always artificially construct it. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, I, don't, I don't have a good example right now, but um, no, I don't think. Um, um, So um, I want to say a little bit about uh, causality theory because it uh, contains some terminology that uh, that I'm going to use later. But the not this is like a whole subject by itself. Okay, uh, you can read books about it, but I'm just going to spend five minutes on it. Um, what is causality theory? So by the way, if anybody has uh, like things, well, this is something I want to read more about it. I mean, ask ask me later for some references. Um, on this topic. Okay, causality theory is about basically only only studying the, the properties of these uh, cones and not necessarily the metric itself. And um, the reason for that is that every Lorentz in the metric immediately uh, gives rise to uh, two order relations. Uh, they are called the, the causal relation and the chronological relation related to causal and time life. So um, the, the causal relation is uh, denoted usually by J, and two points are causally related if they are joined by a, a, a causal curve. So, um, well, there exists um, 
involved with her. And I'm not going to say much about the, the, the regularity or anything like that. But um, yeah, more precise, but it would not really be the, the aim of my talk. Uh, so if you can't join two points by a causal curve, then they're causally related. And um, there's also a time-like relation, a chronological relation, if there exists a time-like curve. Right. And um, you see that uh, the causal relation, so this is the uh, causal, there's a, it's a transitive and reflexive. Relation is of course contained in the causal relation, but it's not re reflexive uh, in general because uh, yeah, we, we don't want to have closed time networks. Um, and another thing is that uh, the causal relation is an open one, whereas the chronological, uh, sorry, it's the wrong way around. The, the causal re uh, relation is open. No. The chronological relation is open, whereas the causal relation is not necessarily closed. So this, uh, uh, so if you consider a point P, uh, then you can uh, define its um, chronological future, and this is going to be an open set. So these are all points that are on a timeline curve um, going to the future of P. And so this is a, a relation to the topology in a sense. And this is also how you can show that uh, that compact manifolds that meet close time like curves, because you can use these uh, uh, chronological futures to have a cover of your manifold. And then because it's compact, you have a finite, co uh, finite cover. And then therefore you can construct um, your, your closed curve this way. Okay. So these are these are basically what the causality theory is about is studying the properties of these relations and they uh, they imply a lot of interesting features um and yeah. friend, you said that j is not necessarily closed yeah and so you can think for example if you remove some parts of your manifold then oh, okay. um so if you have a point here and then this will be your, your chronological future, but um, the causal future would in, in generally include the, the, mm -hmm. the boundary. But for example, you remove this point here, will only include it up to here and then not beyond. And if you have like, uh, like if it's complete and so on, that- Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Okay. This is what I'm going to say now. Oh, sorry, there, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, not, going to, not in that detail, but uh, yeah. There are some, there are some additional assumptions on space time. That give you some some better properties in a sense. And before I write that down, I'm going to tell you what a time function is. This is an important construction of a space time that does not all of space times have this uh, feature, but most of them do. So. Um, so. So M is a space time, then uh, let's just see what the time function is. So this is a function M to R. Is the following properties that um, I'm just going to write it now. That way that uh, Q is in the causal future of P, but not P itself. Then this implies that uh, T of Q is greater than T of P. So this is a function that strictly increases along uh, causal curves, future directed causal curves. Of course, uh, you can if you write a minus and you look at the past, then of course the inequality goes in the other direction. But it is only between causally related points. So the points uh, that are space-like related, they, they don't even matter for this construction. Because I said that everything happens inside the like um, for what we want to do. And uh, yeah, such time functions obviously don't always exist, but um, 
there's a nice result when they exist. And for that, uh, I have to say one more thing. And actually only recently this definition was, I think 2019, this uh, definition was simplified. Um, previously it was much more complicated, so I'm very happy that I don't have to explain this. So this is um, from 2019, if you want that. People kind of overlook this for 50 years, that it can be defined in a simpler way. Um, so a space-time is um, globally hyperbolic. If what we call the causal diamonds, I go back and I'll see what the causal diamonds are. And these are the intersections. I'll draw a picture. Called P and Q. And of course, this set could be zero, right? Um, could be the empty set. Um, but if it's not, then you can assume that uh, you have a point P and you have a point Q. And uh, this would be, well, actually, yes. So this is the call the future of P, and this is the call the past of Q. And then we have this diamond, of course, in higher dimensions, it's really like a diamond. It's like, yeah. Then, uh, if these sets are all compact, then we call our space time global hyperbolic. And this is really one of the strongest and most important properties that a space time can have. And you should somewhat think of it like be having a complete Riemannian metric. So it's really an analog of that for, for, many, for many properties that we want to look at. And, and this um, is a reasonable one to have. Like, can, can you have like, spoke about relative, can you have black hole formation with the hyperbolic? Um, well, yeah, actually, in, in general relativity, everything is considered to be globally hyperbolic mm -hmm. by definition. So um, in, in general relativity, you talk about uh, solutions that are maximally, maximum globally hyperbolic developments. And everything that's not globally hyperbolic, you don't even consider. But of course, what happens inside a black hole? Well, but even the maybe not. The black hole itself, like, would that yep. have some problem with uh, black hole? Like, do we treat it as? A singularity appears, right? Yeah, yeah, but the singularity is in a sense not part of your space time. And everything that's happening curve, inside. Like something that existed before, there is this cosmic yeah. curve for warning time, and then. Yeah, that's right. But but in a sense, you are, yeah, in a sense, yeah, you're running into trouble there. It's, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's a problem. There are surfaces, uh, they're called Cauchy horizons, after which things can go bad, and then you can lose such features. So, but a priori, you assume that you only consider solutions that are globally hyperbolic. But from a, from a causality theory perspective, you consider also lots of other ones. And you can have lots of results about uh, what they're called causal, causal space times, chronological, strongly causal, stably causal, k causal, and there are hundreds of different um, terms. And uh, th these are actually called a causal ladder because one implies the other. And globally hyperbolic is essentially on the top, like that's the strongest one that you can have. Uh, just yeah. to make sure I understand. Yeah. So the space if you are talking, like the space times from which you need to remove the black holes type of phenomena. More or less, yeah. But, 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 you, have, but you have stars that eventually could turn into black holes. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Were there up to a point and then it's not yeah, the everything inside of yeah, everything inside the black hole becomes problematic. Exactly. Anyway, anyway. But globally hyperbolic is also the black holes. Yeah, in, yeah, sometimes but also inside, but sometimes also inside, but yeah, it, it's complicated. As a, the singularity, in a sense, is not part of your space time. It's removed, it's not there. Yeah, but that's like, yeah. it's more like if you were to pick R2 or something like Rn, and then you remove a half line from it, right? So, so that's like, at the moment when a black hole is formed, you kind of remove everything that comes after. And but this is what they say that there's no naked singularity, right? There's already is hidden by the horizon. So when you remove it, yeah. it's it's fine, right? It's really not part of the and uh, space times with naked singularities are not globally hyperbolic. Yeah, that, that's for, for, for that, yeah, that, that, for that's that reason. Yeah. Important. Yeah. I'm going to say a little bit about the, in my second talk why they're still useful, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, they have ugly features that uh, 
Yeah, that a priori we don't want to consider. My question is not so much what yeah. happens once you have the black hole, but the formation of the black hole itself. Now, for the, yeah, for the formation, you, yeah, you know, the, it's very difficult to, to answer these questions actually. For the formation, everything outside, you kind of put a lot of matter together, and everything that remains outside is still fine. But of course, the, the part that goes inside yeah. could be problematic, but it, it's very difficult to study this. And it's partly because all of these results are, are PDE results, but, but this is all geometry or, or even more basic than that. And uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to relate these two worlds. So people don't necessarily even consider, I mean, you know, people don't necessarily even um, check that. Mm -hmm. But for example, the, the singularity theorems assume that they're globally hyperbolic. Mm -hmm. But they also assume a lot of other things that are difficult to have in the PDE world. So it's a, there's a discrepancy if you want. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So I vaguely recall the definition of globally hyperbolic is for something that your manifold is a product. Is yeah. that implied that's by exactly this? what I wanted to okay. say now. Yeah, this is actually one of the important results, and it has to do with the, what I defined here as a time function. So uh, there's a characterization. That um, the upholding of three are equivalent that M is globally hyperbolic. Um, a Cauchy time function, and I'm not going to say no, it's a special time function. Um, in the sense that um, um, there exists a Cauchy hypersurface. Well, that is. So essentially, a Cauchy time function is a special time function. So that the, the level sets of that time function are Cauchy hypersurfaces. And uh, so if I call this a sigma, that they're a causal hypersurfaces. So there cannot be the points cannot be causally related. And they are intersected by every causal, inextendable causal curve. So the curve exactly wants. And um, you're right, there's a splitting result. The, the first splitting result was that then one can prove a spool splitting is implied for this globally. This is a result from uh, Bernal and Sanchez, the result in three. Um, that these, um, well, M is diffeomorphic that if M is globally hyperbolic, then it is diffeomorphic to a product. R times sigma, where this sigma is such a position surface. And initially, this result was only known topologically. So uh, in the 1970s or 1960s, something, this was uh, known as a topological splitting. And then it took another 20, 30 years to, to show this is really diffeomorphic. And this is the uh, in a sense, it's again, you, you start with something space time where you put space and time together and then you kind of have the splitting again and these time functions. So it kind of shows you that if you have globally hyperbolic, you really, you can study um, later. Now I haven't even said anything about the Einstein equations, but um, then you can actually study those as a Cauchy problem because you have this Cauchy hypersurface and you can put some initial data on that and you can evolve them. And that's why you also need this globally hyperbolic in a sense, otherwise you kind of get into trouble with your initial value formulation um, because you don't have such a surface. So it's again, what, what is the question of what hypersurface? Yeah. So these are a causal surfaces um, so that every, every inextendable uh, causal curve intersects it exactly once. But but there are no, so so in particular, there are no two causally related points on this surface. So it's really a Riemannian surface, if you want. 
it's it they, there's you know for example if and you would have something like that and your client comes would look like that then this would not be allowed because um, mm -hmm. yeah so in a sense it's a good hypersurface that only looks at the space spatial parts and it means that inextensible call the curve so it means uh, if you if you want to write this down uh, if you want to say a little bit more, it means that the development of this surface is all of M. But then I have to see what the development is, and the development is exactly all points that, um, so that all inextendable causal curves through that point intersect uh, my, my surface. So if I would remove parts of my manifold, um, then this would be problematic because then it could be that some curves cannot reach that surface anymore. Right. So, so if, if like I look at the things to the right side and remove the two points, then it, it would no longer be a Cauchy surface because those points will Well, this is already not because it's a causal, but uh, for no, example, no, but like, let's say let's say yeah. you had something which was a Cauchy surface. Yeah. And then you remove some points from your space time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then that would cease to be a Cauchy surface. Yeah, for example, if I remove this line here uh -huh. and I have a point here, and of course all these curves will go through, but but these ones wouldn't, they would stop here. Uh -huh. And so that, that would be, yeah, then it couldn't be a Cauchy surface because it couldn't, uh, yeah. And even if I just one point, not that line, just one point. Yeah, it's the same, yeah. Same of course, point, then right? it's just one, one curve or, yeah, all it's the curves through that point. Yeah. yeah, so because then kind of you're kind of blind here. So this is a little bit about pre predictability, why you can then do the PD analysis mm -hmm. um, because you're kind of, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is to motivate. Uh, now I'm going to actually go to, to my second point. I already said I'm going to run into trouble, but I can also continue with that in the second part of the talk. Um, now I'm actually in a position to say something about the Einstein equation. So now I really just uh, talked about space times and the, the manifold, but of course, the Einstein equations are geometric equations. That are, And actually, uh, my, my PhD student has uh, has worked on uh, Lorentzian causality theory and time functions in a more general framework, and we have recovered, for example, this result, uh, but in a topological, in a metric space setting, not of manifolds. So all of these things can be it can be done in in a more general framework, and you can actually see that you don't really need the manifold structure; you need them for topology. And this ordering, this is the only thing that you really need for these results. But of course, for the splitting, you really need to have a manifold, otherwise, you will not get this diffeomorphism. First, about the Einstein equations, and of course, um, not sure how we're going to shorten this a bit now, but um, the basic idea is that uh, we now we now uh, study a gravitational theory that um, that allows for arbitrary speeds and arbitrary gravitation, which is different from Newtonian theory, which is defined on a on a geometric fixed geometric background, and basically only works for for weak gravitation and low speeds. So general relativity should somehow encompass all of that, but it should, of course, agree with the Newtonian theory in the limits. And Einstein um, uh, had this idea that, uh, well, that geometry that is somehow related to the matter content if, by a tensorial equation. I'm just going to write it like that now. So here, this is some kind of a curvature. Um, and this is somehow some constant k and some uh, matter. And uh, the question is, what, what do you use here? And uh, for the matter content, you want to satisfy certain conservation laws. So you want, for example, that the uh, well, the matter content is the conserved, so you want the divergence. So these are zero to tensors. Um, should be zero, so it should be uh, conserved. Um, uh, 
And the basic idea that you would uh, like to start with is, for example, the Ritchie curvature, but the Ritchie curvature is not divergence free. And uh, so, Ritchie curvature does not work. Because what you have, if you compute the divergence, is you have a term that uh, um, involved in the scalar curvature. And so the idea is basically to just incorporate that in the G. So to define G to be the Ricci curvature minus one half. Is, uh, I don't know what I use R. Sometimes I use R, sometimes I use S. Uh, scalar curvature times G. So this is the uh, curvature. And the constant um, computed from some kind of comparison to Newtonian theory. Um, so we get that G is uh, 8 pi G over C to the 4. And most of the times in mathematics, these constants are set to 1. But these are then the Einstein equations as Einstein wrote it down in the beginning. And the first thing he did was compute the perihelion advances of Mercury. And he found out, well, that works works nicely in this theory. These are different Gs, right? On the left. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, sorry. That, yeah, that's a, yeah that, let's just remove it altogether. OK, I uh, mostly actually don't use these constants anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was the Newtonian constant. And C was just like that. Let's just normalize it. And, and so these are, um, yeah, a pi. Well, but you could also, yeah, you could also remove that. But you know, that looks mathematical. You can keep that. <laughs> <laughs> so those are approved numbers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It actually, it actually makes it look better, right? <laughs> eight is a bit random. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, um, I, don't, I don't know how the concept were computed, honestly. Um, and even though you write this G as Ricci minus something the scalar curvature, yeah. this subtraction in there does not remove the trace, right? So somehow we still have the same amount of information. Yeah, exactly. You still have the same information, but the only thing why you did it is because you want to have a divergence free. Yeah. yeah. So it contains the same information as the Ricci curvature, you're right, yeah. And um, actually the vacuum case is also just that yeah, g equals zero is actually just rich equals zero. So this is maybe you want to just study geometry and you don't want to be concerned about the matter content in the universe. You just kind of study this geometric equation. And um, I don't know how much you know about curvature, but the uh, the curvature is a second derivative of the metric tensor, essentially. So this gives you. Um, System of uh, nonlinear um, partially differential equations uh, of second order for G. The components of G are um, and because this is geometric, and of course, uh, uh, you you're considering this up to isometries, um, this is all diffeomorphism invariant. And if you actually want to solve it, you have to stick with a choice of coordinates, uh, but uh, it's independent of that choice. It could be just a bad choice so that you don't manage, but uh, the solution itself is independent of that. Okay. Yeah. Like, uh, plus if you want to include torsion in your connection, because you said with the curvature set. Well, it's always the limit to the connection, yeah. But like, but uh, I don't know if anybody has done that. Because if, if I want to understand, there's no reason to remove torsion. You could still be still symmetric, so you still have the same geodetic equations. So, I have so like never, I have never thought about this. <laughs> But I've only worked with the limit with the connection. I, um, why, why would you not? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if much would change, but yeah. I, if it's a mistake. <laughs> I, I, I could not say anything about that. Um, okay, so these are the equations. I don't know if I um, should uh, go on and say something more about the. Yeah, I can say maybe one more thing. Um, that. Um, this is, of course, the original uh, way that Einstein came up with this, but Hilbert then um, coming from a more maybe, I don't know, thinking a more of a physical idea, 
and all good physical theories come from an action principle if you want to have an action uh, so that the Einstein equations are the all Lagrange equations of, with respect to this action and uh, this is called the Einstein uh, Hilbert action I'm just going to write that down in the case of vacuum, okay? And by the way, you can also include a cosmological constant here uh, to account for the expansion of the universe, uh, but uh, we're not going to discuss any of that here. So you can make it, and you can of course make it much more general as well. I mean, there are a lot of alternative theories of gravity as well. Uh, the only thing that is uh, what I think is relevant to say that. The Einstein equations can also be derived from a common action, that's the Hilbert action, which is basically just the integral of the some constant, of course, again, don't know which one, uh, of the scalar curvature. Okay. And of the volume. And then uh, you compute the, the first variation and uh, send it to zero, and you can. After some computation, you can see that the final Lagrange equations give you exactly the well back here now. Because I only wrote down the I didn't write down any metric. Okay. So this is nice to know. And in that sense, also, um, you can think about the uh, here theory and you see that uh, the symmetries are, are related to conserved quantities. You can ask yourself, what are the conserved quantities? And uh, the conserved quantities are essentially what you derive from this neutral theorem is the, the second Bianchi identity, because you have different work with the invariants. But the second Bianchi identity you anyhow get for free, so you don't gain anything <laughs> by having it. Which one is the second? Um, yeah, it's a differential one. So the derivative of the curvature is zero. Well, not the derivative, but you have these three terms that commute. Um, oh, it's a different three terms, but you change You the add them up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe I should uh, take a break now. Uh, sure, yeah, thanks a lot, Anahat. Uh,